Hello and welcome to this RISC.net webinar, brought to you in association with Cluster7. I'm Joel Clark, Consulting Editor with RISC.net. We talk a lot in the studio here and out in the industry about some of the big risk types that face the industry, whether it's market risk, credit risk or operational risk, and the changes that have come to pass in those areas since the financial crisis. But as the Monty Python idi idiom goes, now for something completely different. We're going to be talking today about EUC risk, that's end user computing risk. No doubt not the most uh, well-known or familiar risk type, but perhaps it should be. We'll come to definitions and explanations shortly, but just briefly, courtesy of Chartist Research, EUC risk is defined as the risk of financial losses due to improper use of end-user computing. And end-user computing are systems in which non-programmers can develop working applications. Importantly, intent is not specified here, so the risk could cover both fraud and human intent. EUC risk has been described as the big elephant in the room, a big, hard-to-quantify risk that transcends business functions, is hard to me measure and is even harder to manage. Charters estimates that EUC value at risk for the largest 50 financial institutions could be as much as $12.1 billion, so it's certainly worthy of our consideration today. I've got a stellar panel with me in the studio today. First, we have Henry Umney, Vice President of Sales at Cluster7. Next to Henry, we have Sam Lee, Head of Operational Risk for EMEA at Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation. Next, we have Sumita Balaga, Director at PwC in the US. And finally, Payman Mesjan, Managing Partner at Chartist Research. So to get us started, perhaps Sam, as, as the practitioner on our panel, I could ask you, how would you define EUC risk and why do you think it's important that we should be thinking more about it? So EUC risk for me is uh, the risk that something may go wrong with the funky spreadsheets and access databases that we all build that are very much a linchpin of our business. Um, the more mature a business is, the more complex it is, the more involved, the more complicated the actual spreadsheets are, and therefore the more reliant people are on them. Trouble is, when you step back and think about that, whether it's market risk models, credit risk models, any other type of model, or even um, spreadsheets that hold secure or confidential data, the issue then becomes, well, who can go in and change that, whether maliciously or otherwise? If someone were to mess around with the VBA code or the macros, would anyone know? Again, intent doesn't really come into it. And when you think about the number of spreadsheets that the average institution has that are considered critical, and then you th think about, well, what if something were to go wrong with those and no one would know, the impact becomes actually quite substantial, but it's understanding what those impacts are um, and then understanding how to control those risks that, that becomes absolutely key. Mm. Payman, you've, I mentioned some of the um, findings that you've found at Chartis and in your research. Can you tell us a bit more about your view on this risk? Yeah, so um, we, we started um, looking into end user computing about nine months ago. Um, and we conducted some research, we did some, some collaboration with uh, Cluster7. As part of that, we did a number of surveys and interviews, interviews uh, of practitioners, uh, advisory firms as well. Um, and it, you know, it very quickly became, became apparent to us uh, as a risk technology research house that um, actually this is a type of operational risk which is somehow uh, gone under the radar of, of the regulators. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's gone under the radar of you know, chief risk officers in, in institutions. And then as we did more research, we, we, we identified a number of uh, publicly quoted loss events, uh, which ranged anywhere between a few million dollars to several billion dollars of losses. Uh, per institution, um, so we became we became very uh, interested in it, and and um, um, uh, you know, as you said, it's a it's a multi-billion-dollar issue. There isn't any formal requirement uh, to measure it and manage it. This is sort of embedded in lots of different types of regulation, um, and we, we think uh, we think it needs to be um, uh, given a higher priority. It needs to. Um, I think the regulators need to look at some form of uh, formalized and systematic risk assessment and measurement around it. Um, and institutions are probably are being hit with it every day, but they don't realize it. 
because it's, it's, it's highly un, you know, underreported mm. and underestimated. Henry, this is Cluster 7's bread and butter. What, I mean, what's your perception of how this is perhaps rising up the agenda or, or maybe should be? So I guess um, what we've seen over the years is there is a greater focus from the regulators, but it's not uniform, it's, it's, it's piecemeal. We, are, we see it propping up in you know, things like uh, model risk management, the SR117, you see it in CCAR, DFAST guidance, where they're starting to say, look, where you have operational systems, there will be, what I describe, holes in it, there will be reliance on end users to be able to augment the functionality of, uh, of those systems to be able to run the business. And they are starting to push people to recognize that. Um, in the past, I guess, we'll, we'll come onto this probably later, but you, you see people having mistakes and they're more reactive to it. We're starting to see the world being more proactive and moving towards um, understanding and recognizing it as a risk. But I guess from my perspective, if you go and talk to people in the business, whether they're running an asset a desk in the asset manager or in finance, they'll know that they rely on some key spreadsheets and some key individuals to run those. It's just, as Payman said, it's, it's, un, it's, it's not widely understood within the organization because it's, it's, it's a risk that there are, more, there are other priorities within the organization at the moment. Yeah. And Samita, I know that at PwC you, you've dealt with a lot of clients that are starting to look at this. What, what's your take on where the industry is? Sure. So I, you know, I agree with uh, Payman, Henry, and, and Sam. What I would say is, from from what I've seen is, um, you know, our clients have been trying to uh, make an attempt at managing the risk. They've been looking at pockets of it. So, uh, with Sarbanes Oxley, the SOC CUCs, I would say that those were the first ones that got um, addressed, or you know, they tried to size that up. Then you had SR eleven seven. So they started to look at models and what now is happening is they're starting to realize that outside of the SOC CUCs and the, and the models, you have everything else. And I think that's the challenge, is how do you, you know, size that up and how do you manage that? Mm. And um, another point I wanted to make, and maybe it'll come up later, is if you think about um, spreadsheets, and access, especially spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, the functionality with, you know, the versions that are coming out, put so much more power into the hands of the end user that they're less and less reliant on IT to build something. And to me, it's great because you know, it helps, the, um, you know, helps you build things faster, but also increases the risk and more reason to focus on it. Yeah. I, I guess to some extent that answers the, the next question, which was really about making the business case. If we accept that um, banks across the industry, financial institutions are at varying levels of recognizing this as a risk. There's obviously a need to make the case to articulate why this is important to senior management to get buy-in in terms of drawing up policies and, and better modeling the risk. So my question, perhaps Sam, I could come back to you. How do you make the case of, and, and what, what's, the, what's needed to sort of enforce recognition of this as a, as a big risk type? I think the first thing, it, I mean, it comes down to the education of how bad this is or could be. You know, it's not about the, the solution. It's not necessarily about the policy. It's about making senior management realize that this is not necessarily something that sits below the radar. It is an all-encompassing, um, high-impact issue. Um, and in a sense, getting them scared sounds a bit harsh, but it's one of the ways that, one of the tools that you need to actually bring it out into the open. So whether it's a case of understanding what the impact is from a, well, if this particular set of spreadsheets were to go wrong and you don't know about it, this is how much we could lose from a monetary perspective, or this is the client impact, in which case you've got that um, mapping to conduct risk or and or market integrity potentially. Mm. It's all of those things that you need to really help senior management understand that this is a big thing that we need to look at. Um, and you know, just to be absolutely clear, risk management isn't necessarily about saying, here's a risk, let's mitigate it. It's about saying, well, here's a risk, how big is it, am I worried about it, and what do I choose to do with that? Do I choose to mitigate or do I choose to accept? If you have this black hole where you actually don't know what you don't know, you have a problem. Mm. So I think the first stage is to make people aware of what the actual impacts of this particular risk are. And then you can have the conversation in terms of, well, what do we choose to do about it? 
can you see that it's big, bad, or ugly, mm. or you know, infinitesimally small? In which case, then we can drive the action off the back of that. And given there's not a huge amount of data, lost data available, how, how do you quantify that? I mean, Payman, I don't know your research perhaps. Yeah, so, um, numbers. There, I mean, you know, I think there is a lot of data. It's just, uh, it's not publicly available. Mm. So, of course, doing this as an outside uh, research firm, we looked at what is publicly available. We looked at uh, somewhere between 18 or 20 loss events uh, that were clearly linked to some kind of a end user application or spreadsheet uh, error. Um, and then we used quite well established, well understood uh, statistical methods, uh, use of copulas, which are used for modeling operational risk. I and mean, if, if we go back 10 years, people used to talk about operational risk in the same way they talk about EUC risk now. Uh, limited uh, data sets, um, quite a conceptual, vague um, 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 type of risk. Until Basel II brought, brought the you know, specific definitions and regulations, there wasn't, there wasn't that much formalized uh, risk management around it. So we've used standard statistical techniques for modeling um, um, you know, concepts which uh, lack data, and, and you know, that's in our paper, and, and uh, uh, we can get to that. So um, uh, the idea was to, at least for the direct loss, the direct financial loss, looking at existing loss data, uh, we can come up with an estimate and, the, and we focused it very much at the largest institutions to start with because this was a directional piece of uh, research and um, the number comes at around $285 million value at risk uh, per annum, um, which if you think about that as a VAR number, and you know, value at risk has been used for many years for market risk modeling and, and, and credit risk modeling. So if you take, um, I won't name banks, but if you take any of the top five or 10 financial institutions, their market risk VAR, which is a well-established number which is printed in their annual accounts, um, is at around 200 to $250 million. So our estimate of EUC risk, which comes around $285 million, risk, makes it highly significant. It is a material uh, area of exposure. Um, uh, of course, we put in a lot of assumptions because of limited data, and we've used um, um, you know, various correlations and dependencies to proxies, indicators to do with size of firm, uh, revenue, gross income, net income, which is using the standardized method for mm -hmm. risk modeling. Um, and um, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a significant uh, bottom line hit when it happens. So I think that's just looking at the direct loss is a, by itself a very compelling mm -hmm. business case. Uh, but then you add to it the reputational, the regulatory effect and potential you know, customer loss effects around you know, financial misstatements. Um, in some of the drill down research that we did, we, we had examples of firms um, uh, making major errors in terms of some of the decision making around budgeting uh, and financial control. Some of it al also to do with HR uh, data, key HR data being lost um, uh, at, at the risk of, you know, s sort of secondary effects in terms of reputation, uh, major headlines in newspapers and, you know, Wall Street Journal and FT and so on. So, you know, the business case is multi-billion dollar business case. Mm. Yeah. Sam, is that the kind of approach you'd, you've taken at SMBC and what, what's the result been? So I think in, in general, basically, um, when you're, let's forget EUC risk for a second, there is this need to look at how do I quantify, in inverted commas, my exposure. And, and yes, I think the use of historical data is useful as a, as a reference point, but you're looking at things that have already happened, whether to yourself or to, to your peers um, in, your, in your peer group or even further afield. I think the important thing is to understand risk impact from a multidimensional perspective, and I think, you know, payment touched on those. So, okay, from a, from a dollar perspective, how much could I lose? That's one thing that you park. Mm. From a reputational perspective, how much, how much am I impacted? You know, so is, is the impact high, medium, or low, or very high? Um, client impact, again, drawing, the, drawing the, the link there with conduct risk. You know, the operational continuity aspect, regula regulatory impact. So all of these dimensions should be looked at 
And I think that the key is to try and boil all of the, the clever stuff off into terms that the business understands. So do we call it high, medium, or low based on those parameters? Um, I think modeling is a very important thing, but without trying to cast aspersions, the average individual will not understand the intricacies of you know, correlations you know, of, of copula. So when, you, when they're sitting in front of senior management and or the regulator to actually explain, well, how did you come up with that particular number or, in, or index, it becomes very difficult to understand and articulate. So if you can boil all of those considerations off into something that people can understand that may be quite fluffy, but actually drives action or otherwise and shows that you're telling a story, for instance, this is a high risk, we choose to do something about it and this is the cause of action. Or we choose not to do anything and we're justified in accepting the, this risk because as long as those things come together, mm. you've actually got the proposition um, there for a framework that works. Yeah. Uh, what, what you alluded to earlier about um, basing it on data you already have, I mean, it, it touches on another point, which is that all of this has been, has, so far, has been reactive rather than proactive. We're responding to regulatory audit, uh, reg regulatory request audits, um, uh, you know, the losses that have been experienced uh, across the industry. How, uh, Henry, in your opinion, how can we make the transition, which I assume we agree we need to, towards proactive rather than reactive? So I guess, go back to the point made earlier, um, <coughs> I guess there's a perception, because although, as Samita said, Excel is becoming, which is the predominant EUC type, is becoming more and more functional and in some respects dangerous to the organization. Perception is it's a, it's a five to ten dollar piece of software we chuck on someone's desktop and as a senior management we're there to look after the big systems that we put in the multi-million dollar system so why, why would we worry ourselves with these little desktop utilities we give to the users and I think if you can change that or get people to understand the power that they that people have got and the danger or the risk you're running in, in giving people that power, then that it's it's all about education to those sen those senior those senior people, and then to Sam's point, once you've you've understood that there is um, a risk to the organisation, is then to have a consistency in measuring it. So we see numbers of organisations that you know have recognised it in different parts of the world or different part different parts of their business and trying to to measure it, but they measure it in different ways. So what you describe as a high risk file in my world could be low risk mm. you know i could be i could be a financial modeler doing you know doing some 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 complex exotic um equity baskets whereas you're doing something um some some simple stuff for around doing some reg reporting mine may be very complex um and therefore i perceive quite high risk the fact that you're sending a very simple statement to a regulator if you get that wrong that is a far a far bigger risk from a reputational um perspective than my very complex model. So there are multiple, as Sam said, there are multiple, multiple dimensions to measuring the risk, um, both in terms of, you know, the, as you said, the financial, reputational, regulatory, and operational risk, but also then te the technical risk to the organization. And you know, these different models pose diff different risks to us, and we need to be able to measure them consistently. Mm. So, I mean, just to extend what Henry is saying there, you know, one way to look at this problem, you know, which sort of emanated from some of the discussions we were having and the use cases we were seeing around it is, is um, information technology activities are happening across all financial institutions. So it's IT. Mm. Um, and there's two types of IT that exist in the world. One is development of software programs, macros, sets of instructions that are under the control of the IT department, right, which is pretty much most applications that are developed um, um, that go into production and the sort of testing user acceptance, very rigorous uh, software engineering uh, methodologies are applied to them. And then there's other types of IT, which is not under the control of the IT department. It's uncontrolled, which is the end user IT. Mm -hmm. And this is, the, this is what we're talking about. 
Um, and spreadsheets is by far the most common form of it, but in financial institutions there's also Visual Basic, C++, MATLAB, R. These are all open, open toolboxes that at the, end, uh, at the hands of financial modelers, quants, uh, and, and uh, you know, business users, increasing the you know, front office. Um, and even if you t take basic sort of risk methodologies of frequency times impact, the frequency of applications that are in the uncontrolled world outweigh the frequency of applications in the controlled world by a factor of 10 to 1 in any organization. Mm. So that's on the frequency side. And then you've got the impact side. Mm. What is the potential impact? Which is a materiality issue. You know, not, not all of them uh, are going to be material. But increasingly, what's very interesting is the overlap between the controlled and uncontrolled world. Um, most software, financial software solutions right now have Excel either in the input or the output side of the value chain. Right, the export to Excel button yes. is the most Ex popular button. Export right? to Excel <laughs> or import from Excel. Right. Suck it in. Okay, there might be some data quantity controls around it, but really the integrity, the data lineage there uh, is not clear cut. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, it's, it's all encompassing. And then when we think about you know, more recent regulations around risk data aggregation and reporting, BCBS 239, which is about really all data, it needs to be aggregated, needs to be transparent, needs to be clear audit trail, and there needs to be a control environment around it. Um, most, of the, most of the BCBS 239 initiatives that we look at, at the moment we're seeing in the market, are all around the controlled world the IT applications, which by definition are lower risk because they're controlled. Whereas I, th I think the spotlight should be on the uncontrolled world, which is the yeah. end user applications. Yeah. So we're almost yeah, uh, but, but that's looking at the yeah. easy part. But if you look at the, the regulation where EUCs are mentioned, it is all around um, the capital modeling. So the BCBS, mm -hmm. SR11, Servant, Solvency 2. So it's all about, so the regulator is now saying that the model piece has been, not been done, but there's a lot of maturity there and there's been a lot of pressure from the regulators to, to get the firms to get, to get those models correct and the assumptions read and consistency of the assumptions, you know, and there's still a lot of work to do, but there are programs that are maturing and that's got senior management focus. To your point, Payman, it's all about what feeds it. You can have the best model in the world. You know, we had a lovely uh, scandal in Europe a few years ago where we had beef burger factories, which all work but great, but if you put horse meat in, beef burgers don't come out. <laughs> you know, if we don't put the right data into, into the models, they aren't going to work. And the, the, a lot of the feeds into those models are spreadsheets, and to your point, in the control of users. Um, I think also the, uh, one of the ironies for me, I'm picking up your point, Payment, on the, the controlled versus the uncontrolled. Even the IT controlled world is actually not well understood because you know IT is a different language to most people. It's highly specialized, has a, a massive horizon, um, and in general, this has just been my experience, the average operational risk generalist will struggle to cope with all of the IT risks. You, know, you need a specialist IT risk function. You know, IT audit is there normally in the, in the third line of defense. You know, they've got their own expertise there. That's the controlled world. Then you've got this EUC world, the uncontrolled world, which has got enough of an IT smell to it that people are kind of going, that's kind of IT, I don't really kind of, I don't get that, it's not hitting me in the face, which again reinforces the point as to why we need to get people to understand the risks of, of the, the uncontrolled EUC space. Just to uh, come to one of the central issues there about who owns this risk, I mean, um, you know, particularly for the, the end user controlled side of things, it, it's very different to managing credit risk or market risk. It's you know, it's a risk that transcends business lines. It, you know, it touches all levels of an organization, potentially. Samita, who's, who's coming to you with this and who's, who's managing it within institutions? Sure. I, you know, I have to say it's been all over the place. And that's been one of the challenges, is there is no one owner. And typically, when we speak to clients, we spend a lot of time just helping them align all the various stakeholders. Because if you think about it, you know, the discussions we've had, EUCs are across the organization. It's not just one silo that owns them. So what we've seen that works nicely is if you have one sort of central body that 
owns it, especially at the beginning when you're you know, first implementing a, um, a policy and selecting the technology. So you have one central body, whether it's you know, a compliance function or internal control, someone has to own it to drive it forward. Mm. And, but you do need that buy-in from the various businesses that are impacted because there's only so much the central body can do to, to really reduce your EUC risk. The, the actual EUC users who are you know, using the Excel spreadsheets, access databases, you know, MATLAB files, whatever it is, they are the ones who have to actually adopt the policy, put in the controls, be aware of the risks, be aware of what they're doing. So it, it, it really is a combination of the central body and the various um, you know, functional groups, business units that are impacted. Mm. How does it work in your bank, Sam? Mm. Well, um, into, well, just as a, a general point, rather than how it currently works in ours, I think there's probably two or three questions that, um, that you kind of ask at the same time. One is who owns the risk? And categorically for me, it's the business that owns it. In the same way, who owns BCM risk? It's the business. Mm. In terms of who's coming to us with this risk, it's typically going to be the ones who kind of get it in the functions, who are the heavy users. Who should be driving and facilitating? You can, I mean, it's a good thing for operational risk to be running because it is an operational risk. That's not to say that they own it. So in the same way that you find a lot of operational risk functions bang the drum, facilitating, wanting this thing to get embedded, whether it's an operational risk framework, whether it's the understanding of operational risk at the DNA level, this is exactly the same. So you've kind of got three different flavors going on here. Um, but absolutely, who owns this? This is the business. Um, the people who should be helping to drive it and facilitating the embedding of it. You know, the operational risk people should be best placed to actually push this forward. But it means that obviously the, the operational risk professionals need to get it themselves mm -hmm. before they can get the business to get it. So they may be the first to understand it, but it's the business that's got to Absolutely. understand it and implement it. In the same way that operational risk, Any we risk. have functions that are out there, yeah. but I'm an operational risk function, but the business still owns, it, owns the operational yeah. risk. Mm -hmm. I need to get them to make sure that they understand that they own it. Yeah. And we're there to support that. I really think the clue is in the name. It's called <laughs> end user risk. <laughs> so it's got to be managed by the end users themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but facilitated and, uh, and supported. So I really do think it's, it's primarily an educational task mm. from the second line of defense, but the actual implementation and ownership is the first line. Mm. Uh, and yeah. Henry, in your client base, how far across that spectrum of education are, are institutions at the moment? So I guess I'm with Samita, we, various people come to us. I think, um, I'd, I, I think the light bulb moment, the, 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 the users getting it, and normally when they've sent the wrong statement to a client or <laughs> audit have come round and noticed there's, a, there's an issue. Um, I, you know, the, the clue, as Sam and Payman said, it is end user risk, but it, it's, got to form, it's got to fall into the standard three lines of defense where you know, it is the business is risk that to be mitigated. We see far too many people trying to pass that off to IT. IT, you know, IT should be happy to take that as long as the business gives them a load of money to build that functionality into their core systems. Mm. Until, till the time, till that time, the risk should remain with the business. Mm. Um, I think the ownership of the policy should be with a second line team. So, ideally, with an operational operational risk team or put as part of the operational risk framework with senior management visibility. Without that senior management visibility, it withers on the vine. And then you do need audit to come behind. If you don't have those three, I mean, and what we typically see is a, a part of the business has had a problem, so you know, they'll engage, they'll, 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 they'll dust off a policy, they'll get some technology, to, um, to put our technology in, but if, they don't st if the second line don't stand up, then it, the, the, the control framework withers. So you definitely need the second line to be Weights and measures to be to be calling those people, they, you know, making sure that they they are remaining remaining within the policy, and then you've got audit behind it. Mm. So it's nothing that you don't do for any other risk, as we you said in your introduction. It's just aligning EUC risk with all the other risks that you mitigate. Yeah. Let's switch focus a bit. We talked a lot about the the definitions and the challenges associated, but let's talk about potential solutions and the way in which uh, this can be managed. I mean, payment talked quite extensively earlier about data. Uh, Sam, I'd be interested from your perspective. To what extent do you think uh, existing metrics that you use for operational risk can be applied here or how, I mean, do we need a new armory of, of tools to, to tackle this risk properly? I think we need to understand the risk first and get it out there. 
um, because I think the, the trouble is, and we, we've seen the same issues in conduct risk measurement, culture risk measurement, people look at metrics and data and then they start going out trying to measure stuff and they get themselves in a terrible tangle mm -hmm. without actually understanding what it is they're trying to measure. Yep. And I think while, and I, as we mentioned before, we need to get people to understand, well, what is the risk, what is the impact we're trying to measure first of all? Do people understand it? What's the solution? And then you can start thinking about how do I then track this? So again, I think you need to think about metrics in, in two ways. One is, are we trying to measure something with a, due, with, with a um, you're trying to sort of understand and discover and detect something? Or are you saying, I've got a risk now, I understand it, I understand the impact, and I've got some measures that I can help monitor it. They're, they're two slightly different things there. And I think we're still at the first stage. We're still trying to understand that risk. So the short answer to your question is, do we have existing things that we can measure this thing? We do. But unfortunately, until we actually understand the it first, it's probably a waste of time. Yeah. You know, because uh, what you don't want to build is what I call the IKEA report. There's loads of metrics here, EUC risk, and there's a whole heap of data with all sorts of charts, you know, pie charts, bar graphs, shadow 3D, great, but management's looking at it saying, I still don't get it. What is it you're trying to tell me? And if they're asking that question, it means that they haven't grasped that risk yet. Yeah. And it means that we've got the wrong measures. So I think we need to do our homework first. Uh, and part of that homework and understanding the risk is presumably drawing up some kind of policy a, a, about, you know, what, what is this risk? I mean, Samita, you've been involved in this. It's, it's, it's a big part of what you've done on this front. What does a, a, a good policy look like? What, what kind of things are you flagging and, and putting in there? Sure. When we uh, advise clients, we talk about the EUC life cycle. Um, so it's, you know, the inventory. So understanding how many you have um, and then risk ranking them, so classifying them into categories depending on the risk, the complexity, um, and then what we call registration, so you know capturing a few data elements about each of the EUCs. Then you define your controls. Um, controls, there's 12 controls we believe need to be, need, that should be applied to each EUC, so defining those controls. Um, and then what we recommend, the next step would be to do what we call a controls gap analysis. So analyzing your EUCs, especially the ones that are more, you know, uh, depending on the criticality, assessing them against your controls to see where you stand, where your gaps are, and, and helping to um, standardize or bring your EUCs up to your standard and your policy. And then you, you, know, you have the, what we call the efficiency aspect. Because one, you know, we look at it as you have controls, you know, you want to put controls on your EUCs, but you also want to look at efficiency. So are you, is there one functional group or one business area that are using so many spreadsheets, do they really need to use that many? Or should it, can it all be combined into one application, into a core application? You know, so assessing that. Um, so th that's how we look at, um, I would say, you know, uh, um, managing EUCs, this life cycle. Then of course you ha you know you'd have your typical your roles and responsibilities your reporting cycle uh, you'd want um, when you come to those roles and responsibilities you need to have accountability at various levels at the end user level so you know there's certain things that they should be doing for example documentation um, and uh, design standards so when they're designing an EUC they're using the right standards up front versus it's always easier to manage something that's been designed properly versus trying to fix something you know that's been not designed that well and so at the end user level then i would say at the functional group business unit level you want to have accountability right and then uh, that's the first line of defense second line of defense is whether it's a operational risk compliance internal control you know some function that comes in does quarterly reviews you know just kind of checks that things are happening and then you have your third line of defense so that's typically what we recommend to include in a policy. But one point I want to add, to note is, with you know, when advising clients, we've seen them, they'll have a be beautifully written policy, but they'll come to us and they'll say we're having a hard time having the business adopt it. So I would say you know it's not just about having a policy on paper. You have to socialize it. 
you have to, um, and what I've seen work really nicely is you do kind of working sessions with the business and with IT, with operational risk, bring everyone together and you know talk about the policy, see what works, because something might make sense for one business unit, say financial reporting, but it won't make sense for another one. Yeah. So you need to have that socialization. Only then do you have a policy that's not just on paper, but something that the business actually adopts. Uh, and I think it's important also from what you're saying that the, the aim of this policy is not to take control away from the end user, but rather to put governance in place and make sure that the, the risks are controlled effectively. Right, right, developing. exactly. I would say, you know, you see owners are very proud of, of their work. If you think about it, they come in every day, this is their, you know, blood, sweat and tears. This is what they do every day. They're very proud of their, you know, files and they want to be aware of it. Some, a lot of times it's not that they don't want to do the right thing, sometimes there's lack of awareness. Yep. And so to put them, you know, create that awareness so they realize that, you know, these controls are, would be, are required, would make their spreadsheets or, you know, uh, files more powerful mm. and more error, error proof. Yeah. But I guess that's an interesting point because inherently, as you say, I, I find if I'm a, in finance or risk and I spend 12 hours updating my spreadsheet, creating this, the last thing I want to know is know there's a new policy coming which has got 12 controls that I'm going to apply and all I go is right, that means I'm now spending 16 hours a day at my desk. Um, and I think there is a fear among the end user community and one of the reasons why this risk gets hidden is because they're so afraid of, A, as you said, Joel, losing control. So in the past when you talk about trying to control Excel, what that means is I'm going to take it away from you, I'll give you back something that looks like a spreadsheet or I'm going to put it into a system and, and remove your ability to innovate and make it more difficult to, to do your job. Um, I guess to your point, Samita, there is a point at which an organisation needs to look at the innovation that occurs in that spreadsheet and go, at an appropriate time, that spreadsheet functionality should be moved into core systems. So if you look at mature policies we see, it's not only about defining what the risk is, roles and responsibilities, you know, and if socialised correctly, the end users don't run away and don't try and hide these things, but it's also for the end users to work with IT to be able to try and decommission some of those files, and it may not be the highest risk ones, but some of the medium flow into the core IT systems. And, and provi by providing visibility and transparency to this end user world, IT's got more of a, an idea of you know, where the holes are in the systems, what, you know, what is the effect of Dodd-Frank or what's the, the effect of CCAR on our IT infrastructure. The best people to ask are the end users. They don't talk to Soundspoint in IT world in writing a spec. What they do is they do it through their own blood, sweat and tears in actually creating the holes and the, the functionality and the reports that are required to meet that requirement because they come in and go, right, we've got a deadline of the next two months to produce a report for the PRA. Trying to you know work with IT to do that, it's too difficult. Much easier, I'll sit there, I will create this report, and in time that matures, and in time that functionality, that, that gives you the blueprint for IT to put it into your core systems. Mm -hmm. So what organisations need to try and tackle, and it, it, to tackle this problem, you've got to try and gauge the users, not drive, drive, drive that activity underground. And the minute you start saying, I've got a new policy, which has got new controls, you know, that's the first, the first sign for, for me to go, you come to me, I go, here's one, and I'm hiding 10 under the table. Mm -hmm. So if you can communica communicate that correctly and say, look, it's not about removing control, it's not about making it more inefficient, it's about actually increasing your efficiencies. You know, we've, in implementing our technology, we've been able to allow people to actually conduct more checks in less time. Um, they're still doing exactly the same things. We're not trying to, the, the organization who put our technology in is not trying to restrict, restrict that capability, mm -hmm. but it's provide transparency around what most people do actually correctly. It provides evidence they're doing it correctly, but also if you engage our technology a certain way, you can actually improve the efficiencies as well. Actually implementing common standards, that, that's the challenge, and making sure you've got that balance, because <coughs> the whole point of EUCs is that the user can build it. If he's all of a sudden thinking that he's complying with some pseudo IT application philosophy, he's going to think, well, what's the point? You know, why should I go to the nth degree and do those 12, 24, 36 controls? This is becoming an I a pseudo IT app. Mm -hmm. So it's making sure, I, th I still think <coughs> we're back to the, how do we embed that um, DNA about, look, you've got some funky stuff going on in here. You want to build something there is risk attached to that. Do you buy into the fact that there is an impact? 
So how do we collectively help you manage that so that we don't collectively come a cropper? Mm. As opposed to, again, starting with the process, the policy, and saying, thou shalt do this. So it is, you know, to Samita's point, it's got to be socialised. We've got to get them to understand the so what, first of all. Yeah. I would add another point that I've seen is um, in terms of just training, so this goes to the design standards as well as just awareness of um, you know, Excel functionality. And that completely varies. And um, so we'll see clients where you'll have one group, or perhaps all in the same group, you'll have one user who's pretty, has very basic functionality. If you look at any, every, anyone's um, resume, it always says, you know, Excel, right, or, you know, proficient in Excel. There's no way to measure how proficient you are. So you see varying um, degrees of um, expertise in Excel. So you'll have one, you perhaps one person who has basic knowledge, another person who's very advanced. And then, but they're, they're sharing the same file. And so a lot of times that, uh, you know, causes some of the, um, the confusion or um, the risks and errors. So, so I would say it's the design standards as well as um, increasing training to bring everyone's level up to the same standard. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I guess there's an additional point there, which is, you know, there's always the expert. Maybe it's a Cambridge graduate who's sitting or an MIT graduate who sits there, and you go, I've got this new requirement, codes this thing up, then goes and gets another job somewhere else. The key man risk. How do you know how this thing works? Um, and again. A lot of that can come out of some of the policy stuff by, you know, registering a file. Who is the key developer? Who's the owner? Who's it? So we can start recognising that we've just created in our risk function, you know, thirty spreadsheets reliant upon one person. You know, is there, is there anybody who actually understands what he's done? And actually providing that visibility, coming back to what Sam says, is actually define what are the risks. One of the key risks is just a simple one: key man risk. It's people risk. Yeah. People. Right. So you know, one one bloke's developed everything. Yeah, this, I mean, this is the classic. You know, 20 years ago, because I'm old enough to think about it, software programs were built like that. And you were exposed to the key programmers leaving and going to another com uh, company, and the knowledge goes with you. And, and the code will be millions of lines of code. No one can make sense of it. Then came in various software engineering standards around documentation, uh, record keeping, um, uh, you know, various knowledge transfer standards so that there isn't, the knowledge isn't in, in the individual, the knowledge is in the organization. Um, um, which, you know, most good IT departments have that, but not in the end user end of IT mm -hmm. development. It's in the, uh, you know, uh, the, the controlled world. But I think one aspect of this that I think is underestimated, results in a lot of underestimation and therefore the end users themselves not realizing how important this risk is, is that um, most organizations can be described, it's just one, it's just another way of looking at an organization as a vast hierarchy of end user applications. If you think about um, the business lines by asset class, they look, you look at the front office and the back office, so HR, finance, audit, they all have thousands, tens of thousands, if in some cases millions of spreadsheets, code that has been developed by end users. Each individual piece by itself to the end user might not look that risky, but then if you create a dependency model and link all of these in terms of inputs and outputs and functions, it becomes a complex, non-linear, complex risk situation. Mm where something that to the end user might seem like a very simple spreadsheet, somewhere down the dependency model feeds a very important decision at group level. Without that clear control and transparency, that decision w could be I don't know, entering a new market or, 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 or um, a, you know, designing a new product um, or you know, setting the bonus thresholds for key traders. Those decisions are huge. They can create, they can move the needle in terms of profit and loss. So I think, you know, this idea that the end users themselves can assess their own risks, I think it's important in terms of ownership, but you do need this umbrella layer of risk assessment mm. and, and looking at the aggregate effect 
of end user applications beyond the individual silos as well. And that, that, that's a lot more complex. And it, it needs a sci scientific approach. I don't think it's a fluffy, let's just do a high, medium, low type yeah. approach. I think you, you alluded to it as well. We also need to punch through the, um, w w we've been talking a lot this, this afternoon about um, essentially funky spreadsheets where there's code and macros. Actually, you can have some very, very high spreadsheets that are all hard coded. This stuff might be going to one of our tax <coughs> authorities. That's right. You know, or it could be um, loaded up into our payroll um, portal to, be, to pay people bonuses or otherwise. Actually, those are pretty impactful as well. There's no macro in there necessarily. So you know, it's not just the whizzy PhD stuff. We, that's a, we, again, we're back to making people understand what the impacts are on those multidimensional levels, yeah. so they can get it. You know, and I think it's a good point, Payman, in terms of understanding that full value chain. This thing on its own may not seem like a big deal, but you know, wh what's the, what's the front to back, and what are the implications? Mm, where it fits in the overall yeah. decision making. Yeah. And then one other point that I think is it, it came up in a lot of the interviews, a lot of the research that we did that I think we haven't touched on enough is data privacy and security. Mm. Mm. So much private information, confidential information, be it at the people level, HR level, or financial level, sit, sits on these spreadsheets which are uncontrolled and, and unsecured as well. And that's another type of uh, exposure, uh, particularly from a reputational point of view. Yeah. A lot of what Samita was talking about, about things that need to go into this uh, policy, if you like, are qualitative things about governance, checks and balances, procedure, process, people. Your research is, uh, sets out some kind of quantitative suggestions for analyzing and, and measuring the risk. In terms of where we are now, I mean, how do these two elements of this work hand in hand? Um, how far are we away from being able to put the quali quantitative stuff into practice? You know, um, I think we're a long way from uh, real detailed scientific quantification. And really, that, you know, the detailed scientific quantification wasn't the primary objective of our research. Uh, we were just trying to understand the order of magnitude of this. You know, so you know, we, we were in discussions where for organizations that had implemented something. We were asking them, what's the size of the problem? Is it a $10,000 problem? Is it a million dollars? Is it $100 million? Is it a billion dollars? What's the size of the problem? So really, th the objective of our research, and I think we've got there, you know, based on a number of estimation and assumptions that we can back up, that this is hundreds of millions of dollars for the largest institutions is a multi-billion dollar issue. Mm. This is not low million dollar issue. So I think the order of magnitude, we've got a handle on it. Uh, but actually, now that we know it's a big problem, you know, we don't want to get uh, analysis paralysis trying to come up with mm. sophisticated mathematics around it, which I'm sure others will do. I think there's a lot of area for the research, but it's a big enough direct loss and exposure from this, and you add to it the indirect losses that we're talking about, that a com there's a compelling business case mm. for, for financial institutions to put in proactive steps in place mm. and not wait till something bad happens and then they have to react to it. Uh, and, and um, you know, other loss of reputation, regulatory relationships, and so on. So I think that the, 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 you know, the business case for proactive risk management here, for a risk which is un misunderstood and, you know, underestimated, to me looks like very similar to the sort of discussions that the industry were having about operational risk 15 years ago, and more recently, five, six years ago, people were having the same discussions about cyber risk. No one argues about cyber risk now, mm. because enough people have been hit with, uh, with it. Um, um, but you know, we think EUC risk is in the same sort of category. Sam, do you see it following the same trajectory as those other risks? I think so. I mean, cyber risk is an interesting one for me, because you've seen people hit by it. I still think that people don't fully understand cyber risk. And you talk to 10 different people, I'll give you 10 different definitions. We're quantifying that one as well. I mean, but, but you know, the interesting thing for me is when you speak to boards, most will talk about cyber risk. Here's some money to sort out cyber risk. Yeah. But again, they st I, I still firmly believe they haven't understood enough of it. You know, if you ask the average Joe, they'll say it's about hacking. Okay, fine, someone hacks it. So, so what? And then that's when you need to start teasing out, well, someone could actually nick client data or our data and use it. Or 
um, they might there might be a um, an attack where we actually can't do anything and our systems go down and clients can't be paid. Now we're starting to talk about the so what. So, and this this is I think cyber risk is further along the curve. People still need to understand that full so what and talk about how do not just how do we prevent it because you can't. I can spend all the money that I want on burglar alarm systems. If someone wants to get into my house, they will. Mm. We need to also spend money um, on, well, when they do get in, how do I contain the impact? This is the same sort of thing. And we still need to get up that curve, get people to understand, well, what does EUC risk actually mean? What are the impacts? When it goes wrong, because it will go wrong, how can I actually contain the impact? And that's where the policies, the framework, the controls you've got in place will help all of that. Mm. So it needs to catch up. But again, it's about education. It's the same theme. Yeah. We're, we're nearly out of time, um, but I want to just uh, give each of you a, a quick chance to talk about the kind of what, what should the priorities be, if you like. That we've covered the kind of the main uh, areas of this issue, but looking forward to the next few years, tackling EUC risk. What are the biggest challenges and what, what should the priorities of the industry be, Henry? So I think it's education. I think the senior management need to be aware that, I mean, as famous research, the Charters Research says, you know, there is a direct financial impact on organisations, but that the reputational uh, risks, um, you know, the regulatory fines are far more embarrassing and the numbers, may, you may be able to contain those losses but the embarrassment is too great. And to Sam's point, it, whilst um, it's not as well known, there are many unreported incidents which are highly embarrassing. You send the wrong, wrong statement to a client and you have to admit that that was based on you know, a bunch of spreadsheets. A, a, a graduate who left 10 years ago created doesn't look very good for, for a professional organisation. So it's education recognises a risk. I think the regulators are pushing that way, but then it's not just within individual individual silos. It's across the piece and just recognise it and just embed it within your within the risk framework. Yeah, Sam. Well, without trying to sound lazy, that that's the biggest one for me. It's that <laughs> yeah. educational piece. You know, making sure the business gets it, but also that the operational risk teams get it. You know, yeah. In the same way that I think a lot of operational risk functions have got up the curve now. They get it, they're going out, they're trying to embed this thing called operational risk. This is an operational risk. So op risk teams need to be fully aware of this. They need to get it like the back of their hands, because if they don't, they're not going to be able to help the business get it themselves. So I think that's got to be a key focus. And once it comes into that fold, then all the good stuff about well, what are the impacts, how do we measure it, how do we get it on the table, how do we build it into our framework, how do we write the right policy, how do we drive the right solution, um, you know, and, and get the business case sorted out for this and, you know, in the framework of, well, how, how high up the pecking order is this? Um, that's when all of that starts to come together. Yeah. So, so it is about that embedding and, and education. Yeah. Sumitra and Payman, I'm challenging you to come up with something Yeah, I, uh, no, I, I agree with the education and the embedding. It should, to me, if a policy is successfully, you know, adopted, it's second nature, right? What, what I will add is thinking about where you know, say Excel, or you, even if you think of some other technologies where they're, they are going, they're, again, it's so much more power to the end user. And how do you, you know, so, and, and this is why embedding the controls is going to become more and more important. Because the time lag between, you know, when you design something, get some data, do some analysis and publish it, mm. is becoming much, much more shorter. Yeah. Before you had, you know, some time, a couple of weeks, you could go back and check things, but now, even if you look at the expectation, everyone expects results immediately. So the I would say the shift has to be more on controls built in versus kind of this um, detective type of a control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it's going to be an unmanaged risk until the regulators come up with some regulation around this, actually. It's... Um, Fighting for airtime to some extent. Maybe. Yeah, y you know, because of the ownership issue that w w we talked about, and the fact that it is all so all across the enterprise, you know, everyone touches some kind of end user application, either as a, as a user or developer, you know, several times a day, um, uh, and that makes it difficult. Well, the, you know, when when the ownership is fuzzy and 
there is the knowledge and education isn't there and the leadership isn't there, it's going to be unmanaged. Mm. And you know, I keep going back to the operational regulations. Operational risk has been around forever. Well, we only had formal systems and policies around it after Basel II, mm. when there was a piece of regulation, capital needed to be put aside, and there was specific you know, pillar two, pillar three requirements around disclosure. Then we started getting formal systems and processes. Yeah. So I actually think that the regulators need to wake up and make this something formal and explicit. In, you know, implied risk doesn't get ma managed, unfortunately. In the, in the modern world where you've got so many explicit mm -hmm. regulatory requirements around stress testing, around model risk, around liquidity risk, and so on, it is always going to be at the bottom of the list because it's not explicit enough. Yeah. Uh, implicit, tacit knowledge is not good enough, I'm afraid. It should be. It makes sense. But in the world of decision making, until it goes really up the regulatory uh, agenda, I don't think we'll get the kind of action that's required. So my message is for the regulators, actually. I agree. It's yeah. an original way to end a webinar, asking for more regulation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> my only challenge to that is, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying, Payman, is when you look at what we've got in terms of local regulation, FCA, PRA, previously FSA, in terms of operational risk, things like, RCSA, scenario analysis, loss events, that's not in there. Okay, we've got some high level guidance at the Basel level, but we don't actually have it at the, at the, London, at the UK level. They kind of drop that stuff in through their informal um, arrow reviews and brought in market expectations that way. If, if you, and I'm not trying to sound like an idealist here, although I probably will sound <laughs> like it on the <laughs> webinar. When you look at the regulations and read between the lines, they're trying to get management to understand all their risks, mm. own it and manage it. This falls into that. So rather than wait for regulators to say, thou shalt do that and use that as a stick, if we actually take it into our organizations and embed that, that DNA piece, and flag this is another risk you guys haven't thought about it, then you're actually going to be um, coming full circle. But I agree with you, but the fact of the matter is stress testing, model risk, capital adequacy have also been implied for many years in regulations. Yeah, right. But the programs and initiatives and investments really started when there was an expli explicit piece of regulation yeah. from OCC on model risk. I there was a specific, mm. but I think, you know, there's a balance between principles and rule-based, okay, and, and, mm. and, and I think this one is too much relying on interpretation and principles, and the pendulum needs to go a little bit more rule-based and well, prescriptive. No one's really said anything not, about not, it. No, no, I, I agree. Not yeah. you know, over, to overplay it, but you know, to be fair, you're not, as a risk practitioner, you're great, but you're not representative of the marketplace. Agreed. Mm. Okay, so if I can summarize then, it seems that the, the key issues here are um, educating the industry first and foremost about, about this risk, about what is EUC risk and making sure that it's well understood right up to senior management, um, embedding it into day-to-day -day decision making and also um, you know, thinking about what might come next in terms of, as Payman said, regulation and whether that's going to be the, ultimately the, the stick that's needed to incentivize better management of this risk. Um, so I think you know we've we've covered a lot of ground, and I'd like to thank you all for for taking part. It's been a really interesting discussion, and I think the message for our listeners is watch this space, and, and thank you for listening. <laughs>